Chapter 10 of our book is called The Cross. And in this chapter, the High King of Heaven sent his only Son to earth to die for the rebellious race. Now let me say that again. The High King of Heaven sent his only son to earth to die for the rebellious race. This is backwards. The pagan gods demand parents sacrifice their children to the gods. Bob and I had a distinct pleasure of taking our wives and visiting the great Inca capital of Machu Picchu in Peru. It's an incredible city, a testimony to both the engineering and architectural ability of the indigenous peoples in South America. And while we were having a tour of this great Inca capital, our tour guide took us to an altar, a slab of stone overlooking the valley below. And she said, this is the place where the Inca gods demand that parents sacrifice their children to the gods. So you are to sacrifice your strongest son or your most beautiful daughter. We all know from the Old Testament the god Molech demanded child sacrifice. Throughout history the pagan gods have demanded the sacrifice of children to the gods. In our own generation we serve and worship a pagan god. This god is called the god of convenience. And we bow at the altar of convenience and sacrifice over a million babies every year in the United States alone before they're born because it's not convenient to have a child at this point in my life. So it's not just the ancient Incas. The modern world has its pagan gods that demand the sacrifice of children as well. But in the midst of this context, the Bible has a message. The God of heaven sent his only son to earth to die for pagans. He sent his only son to earth to die for you and I. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. What kind of a God is this? What kind of a God would do such a thing? This is an incredible God. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. Why a perfect life? Because God demands perfection. And you and I are sinners. We cannot provide that perfect life. Jesus came and lived a perfect life in my name, for me, so that the righteousness of God becomes my righteousness in the ledger, in the accounting book. The righteousness of God becomes my righteousness. I remember when I was much younger, I was buying a car and every month I had to go to the bank to make a car payment. And this particular day I went in with my car payment and went to the teller and she brought up my account and 
She said, well, Mr. Miller, your account's been paid off. <laughs> and I thought, my account has been paid off. I just bought the car a few months ago and I've only made a few payments. No, Mr. Miller, it's been paid off. And all of a sudden I realized that God made the payment for me. Jesus lived the perfect life for me. And then the lady put some things in and said, oh, Mr. Miller, I'm sorry. It really hasn't been paid off. <laughs> but I took in that moment, I understood something profound about what Christ has done. He lived a perfect life in my name. And then he died the death that I deserved. He died on the cross the death that I deserved. This is the good news. Christ lived for me and he died for me. After his death, they took his body off the cross and they put it in a tomb. And is that the end of chapter 10? No. If it were the end of the chapter, it would be the end of the story. But at the end of the chapter, Christ rose from the dead. And all history was transformed. Up until this moment in history, death always won. If you died, it was over. You were dead. Christ conquering death, Christ rising from the dead, marked a turning point, an epic turning point in all of human history. Death lost, life won, and history will never be the same. In our churches, we have a time of celebration of the resurrection of Christ, and it is a worthy thing to celebrate, but I think there's times where we put the resurrection in this religious holiday mode. But the early church understood the reality of the resurrection in a way that we do not. Rodney Starks, in his book, the rise of Christianity asks the question, if there's no God and there's no miracles, how do we explain the most profound sociological movement of all times, the rise of Christianity? So he was a sociologist that wanted to study this phenomenon. And he gave a number of illustrations of what the early church was like and one of them, I remember, he talked about the plagues that swept through Europe. Plagues that, that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And at the time of the Roman society in Europe, for the Romans, cruelty was a virtue. If you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, or if you've seen the movie The Gladiators, you've seen Rome in all her glory. Cruelty was a virtue, and for the Romans, compassion was a vice. Compassion was seen as weakness. If you were compassionate, you were weak. And we all remember those of us that saw the movie The Gladiators, how the gladiators fought in the Colosseum and at the, this most dramatic scene now there's only two left and one of them is on his back, his sword has been removed from his hands and the one he is fighting is standing triumphant over him with the, his sword on the man's neck. And the gladiator who's standing is looking to the crowd in the Colosseum, what should I do? Should I let him go free or should I kill him? And you know what happened. All the crowd said, kill him, do it, do the deed. Why? Because Rome was cruel. Cruelty was a virtue. 
Compassion in Roman society was a vice. But society begins to change when a small band of men and women worship a God of compassion. And they began to live compassionately in the midst of a cruel society. And think of what that means and how that could cost. But for us today, we need to think on these things because this is what God is calling for us in our day, in our generation. So they were called to live compassionately where compassion was seen as weakness and in a society that was utterly cruel. And God used the lives of these Christians to demonstrate His love in this broken society. When the plague swept through Europe, the Romans would throw their family members out on the street. And what would happen? The Christians would take these children, these mothers, these grandmothers, off the street into their own homes because they worshiped a compassionate God and they took care of these, of their pagan neighbors. They loved them. They demonstrated the love of God to their pagan neighbors and they did it in ways that cost something because many of these Christians caught the plague from their pagan neighbors and died. And many of the pagan neighbors survived the plague because of the demonstration of the love of God coming from these Christians. And when the, the plague was over, many of the pagans came to Christ while those who cared for them were buried. How could these Christians do this? Because they understood the resurrection. It wasn't just a religious holiday. They understood that when Christ conquered death, all of history was transformed. And now they could live lives that did not fear death. What are you afraid of? What fears do you have that keep you from following what God might be calling you 